gosh, I'm trying to hold it in right now. Um, the, the support's been overwhelming. Tickets for Nashville this week are nearly sold out. We are calling this the Bryson Effect. <laughs> I mean, with how much support we have out here, and it's just the start, that's that's a testament to what Live Golf is and what the Crushers are doing, what uh, our team's doing, and um, what we're trying to do for, for Nashville and places all across the globe. So super excited for the, the future of Live. to at least walk down the last few holes or at least the last hole knowing that it was pretty much done. It's never safe, but um, very proud of everybody. And, and of course, Tiro. I mean, what a week to to get his first win in a few years and win by six in an absolutely dominant performance the way he did. Uh, it was absolutely incredible, so I couldn't be happier for him. Certainly with not winning for three and a half years, you kind of naturally question if you if you can do it again. Um, so I'm, I'm just proud of myself to, to be able to get through that and um, play the way I did. Welcome to our number two live right here on this Thursday on the early line on Sports Grid. I am Ben Stevens. Donnie is here as well, of course, and now joining us from the very jump to start off this second hour. It's our coach, James Young, JY, the first of five exhibition games for Team USA as they get ready to chase the gold medal at the Paris Olympic Games on the hardwood. We'll look back on last night in Las Vegas against the Canadians and of course the change to the roster made yesterday. Kawhi Leonard is home. Derek White is now in. So much to get to here JY and we'll dive deep into the five game slate we saw yesterday on camp day in the WNBA. Thanks for being here on this Thursday morning. Good morning, guys. Good to be on with you. And yes, it's, it's amazing that we're in July and there's still so much to talk about in the world of basketball. So, JY, we got the news late in our show yesterday. The big development that Kawhi Leonard was leaving Team USA, would not be there as a member of the roster at the Paris Olympic Games. Here is the statement from Kawhi, from Team USA Basketball. Kawhi has been ramping up for the Olympics over the past several weeks and had a few strong practices in Las Vegas. He felt ready to compete. However, he respects that USA Basketball in the Clippers determined it's in his best interest to spend the remainder of the summer preparing for the upcoming season rather than participating in the Olympic Games in Paris. First, we start with Kawhi Leonard leaving. What was your reaction? How big of a hole is this to fill for the Americans? Well, listen, Ben, this is probably one of the best or better two-way players on this team. A guy that is a lockdown defender and someone that could score and score from three. Now, l let's look at Kawhi Leonard, uh, not the player, but Kawhi Leonard, the concern. And what is the concern? The concern, Ben, is always going to be the health. This is a guy that misses time after time, game after game. This is a guy that did not play in a postseason. This is a guy that misses time all the time, even though he played 68 games in the regular season this past year in the NBA and had a great year. But you know this, Ben. This guy misses a ton of time. So if you're a team like the Clippers and you just gave this guy a three-year extension and he's the cornerstone of the team with Paul George leaving – Maybe this isn't the worst thing for the Clippers. It's probably the best thing because you need a healthy Kawhi Leonard to be there. Now, I am shocked that he even got selected in the first place, Ben. I, I didn't get it. I thought that this was a kind of a reach for a guy, like I said, who can't stay healthy. But to me, right move, getting him off the team. I also wonder, Ben, was he going to start in this team? 
And was that going to be okay for a guy like Kawhi Leonard to say, Kawhi, you're not starting. You're coming off the bench. Yeah, coach, that's what I was talking about. Like, I love conspiracy theories. And, you know, it just came out of nowhere. We weren't hearing that he had a bulky knee for weeks on end here. And for him just to abruptly leave camp, leave some of those questions out there. But I'll tell you what wasn't questioned yesterday. Team USA is still a pretty good team without Kawhi Leonard. An 86-72 victory over Team Canada at a sold-out T-Mobile arena in Las Vegas. Sloppy to start, but the U.S. did gain its ground. And the one thing I was talking about, some of the quotes post-game, coach, which I liked was, they look like they really want to hang their hat on playing great defense, and they did that versus Team Canada. Yeah, I think that's an important thing. Uh, of, listen, defense is your absolute. I've always said that as a coach. Whether you're scoring or not, your defense is something you got to hang your hat on. So what that does is if games that you're scoring well offensively, it allows you to blow teams out. But when you're not scoring or shooting the ball well or turning the ball over like Team USA was last night, it allows you to maintain your focus and then get out and transition and get run out. I think that was the key to the USA team. Listen, simply put, I have concerns. You guys know it. Rebounding is a concern, right? The three-point shooting, which was only at 30.43% is, was a concern, right? But if you defend like this, it ain't going to matter how bad you are offensively because you have enough no. firepower offensively that you're going to score enough points. Their defensive intensity wasn't tremendous for an exhibition game, and I think that is the key thing. You hang your hat on the defensive end, and then you go from there. Offensively, even though they didn't look great, what I did like, 25 assists to 37 field goals. That means they were sharing the ball. There was, there was sacrifice. And when you get a bunch of superstars players together, Donnie, your concern is can you sacrifice yourself for the good of the team or for the good of the country? They certainly did that last night. Anthony Edwards, the leading scorer for the Americans last night, 13 points. Steph Curry into double figures. Drew Holiday into double figures. Anthony Davis, a double-double, 10 points and 11 boards. J.Y., there were two Boston Celtics that were featured in the action last night. Drew Holiday, Jason Tatum, and the replacement for Kawhi Leonard is another member of the Seas. That is Derek White, officially announced yesterday after Kawhi Leonard leaves Team USA. Obviously, it's going to take this roster some time to gel, but how does Derek White fit into Team USA's pursuit of a gold medal? Just another team guy, good, really good defensively, second team all NBA uh, defensively. So, you know, this is a guy that can come off the bench that will play defense, a guy that's in, that won't care about his role, won't care about getting shots off. So it does help. Now, let's be honest, Ben. I mean, let's get our popcorn ready for training camp because there's another something that wasn't happy, and that's Jalen Brown with his Donnie right side conspiracy theories in full effect. <laughs> so, I mean, yep. I think it's something that we'll want to watch for. But I'm going to say this, and I hope this comes out the right way. This is no disrespect to Derek, to, to Derek White at all. He's not a better player than Jalen Brown, but I think he may fit. And to me, yeah. just the way that Jalen Brown reacted to not being selected makes me feel like, ready, folks, this was the right move because this kid may have come in and maybe wanted a little bit more time, wanted a little bit further because he's not thought of, even though he was NBA Finals MVP, he's not thought of, right, Ben, in that top 10, top 15 category in the NBA. So he may have come in and tried to show up and show out. So I honestly think... If it went the other way and Jalen Brown got in and Derek White didn't get in, Derek White wouldn't have said a dang word. He just would have accepted it and moved on. I actually think, Ben, it was the right decision to go with Derek White. If we, Jay White, if we do take a look at this team overall, right? You saw the game yesterday with the statistics. They're pretty even here. Most of the guys got a similar mm -hmm. amount of minutes just to get that run on the court and see where they fit in. Come Olympic time, and so let's just say the knockout stages, who are we leaning on with Team USA? Like, who's going to be logging the most minutes? And also, who is going to be that go-to guy down the stretch with all of these superstars? Somebody has to have that basketball. Well, I, I like, I, I'm going to say this. If you take the starting lineup from last night, We'll see what happens when Durant gets healthy. The one thing I would say is this. The game flipped early once Ant Edwards got on the floor. And he came out aggressive. He came out really saying that he wanted to be that number one option. I'm not saying he's going to be the number one scoring option for Team USA. But you got to admit, they looked a little bit different once he got on the floor after being down. I think it was 10 or 11 to 1 early on in that game. So 
he's going to be a guy you want to watch it for. Maybe you swap on him for Devin Booker. But listen, Steph's going to start. We know that. LeBron's going to start. You know, we know that. Probably Embiid's going to start because they just recruited the you-know-what out of him, right? So now it's down to those two spots. I think eventually we're going to settle on Durant, and we're going to probably settle on Ant Edwards. But don't mistake it. If we play a team like France that's really big, you may have to go big, big, which may have to go like AD, Embiid at the 4-5 or five to match up with something like uh, Gobert and Webanyama. Katie did not play last night dealing with a strained calf. He should be ready for the Paris Olympic Games. JY, just one game in a five-game exhibition series, but against the team that has the second-best price to win a gold medal, the Americans, despite a sloppy opening quarter, won by 14. Does yesterday do anything in your mind to show just how in front Team USA is? I mean, we're close to a $5 odds-on favorite anyway. Yeah, they, they really are, Ben, because here's the thing, and I just said it in the beginning of the segment. If they defend like this, if they defend yeah. like this, Ben, there's no one in the world that's going to beat them in a basketball game. Total was 200 and a hook last night for the exhibition game. We stayed yeah. well under that with a total of 155. We're back on the early line around the WMEA next. Canada is one of those teams that's the darling of, of the tournament right now. They're still 9-1. to one. To win a tournament or even to advance far into a tournament like this, you need a bit of good fortune. And it doesn't matter if you're getting the good fortune that Canada has where they played two matches where they were up a man or you had the good fortune of Argentina, who's one of the best teams in the world, who just got on the good side of the draw. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. I want to know, too, what was the highest you ever got on both of those metrics? So the highest club I speed I've ever gotten with a 45-inch driver, we'll just say stock, was, I think it was 129.9. I never cracked 130. <laughs> never cracked 130. That was, that was juice. That was on caffeine. I can't even talk. And then I got one, 195 ball speed. 195 so was, ball speed. Only on Sports Grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. The early the line. Magical and historic season in Lincoln, Nebraska continues. He is the best player in the NBA, but also in the biggest moments where the national media is watching. Newswire. Something that we have never seen happen before with one of the iconic coaches in the game. Pharrell, coast to coast. The team covers. It's automatic. It's every time. Not, not sometimes. It's every time. Game time decisions. Lucas is actually far more dangerous from three on the road this year than at home. This game here tonight, you may want to consider taking as many points as humanly possible. In-game live, prime time. We got not one, but two coaches fired systems in place. Sports Rage this Late sort Night. This sort of written all over it. It's going to be hard to match the emotion that they played with the other night. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Camp day yesterday in the W, a five-game slate where all five games tipped by noon local time in their respective cities and at those venues. What a day it was, five games in the WNBA, and it started, JY, at 11 a.m. Eastern time in Connecticut between the top two teams in the W, the New York Liberty, the Connecticut Sun, who both entered yesterday 17 and 4, battling for that top spot at the top of the table that now belongs to the Liberty. 71-68, the victory for New York. They even cover as a slight two-and-a-half-point road favorite in Connecticut. A total of 158-and-a-half stays under. How big of a win was that for New York to take that number one spot in the WNBA? 
It was a great spot. Really quick, folks, shout out to the WNBA. We do this in women's college basketball as well. We call it a school day game where you get a lot of young kids that don't have the opportunity to go watch the uh, college basketball. Shout out to the WNBA for taking a day, a day and doing that across the country. Now, when you look at the game in Uncasville, Connecticut, 71-68, what was amazing to me, Ben, is a team in the New York Liberty, arguably the best offensive team metric-wise in the WNBA, won a game playing a completely different way, half court, didn't shoot the ball well, and locked down defensively. They, listen, Ben, they shot 3 of 13 from 3. That is god-awful. But when, when you have, you know, Brandon Stewart dominating with 14 uh, rebounds, John Quill Jones giving you 11 rebounds, they lose the rebounding battle by 2. But to me, the biggest play, the play of Sabrina Anescu. Big bucket down and stretch, up by 1 to put him up of three, and then the game ceiling block. We talk about this big three or big four, if you want to call it Vanderson, or even in starting five, if you talk about Benazza Laney Hamilton, who come, that did not play yesterday. They showed last night, Ben, I thought for the first time, an ability to win a grinded out game where they can't mm. score offensively. You know it, I know it, Ben. We both watch a lot of W. It takes defense, especially in the playoff, to win games. That's how the Liberty won it, and they now not only have a one-game lead in the standings, but they've won both matchups versus the Sun, both in Connecticut, which means the next two games to end the regular season happen in New York. Next game, I do believe, is next week. How about that? 18 wins now for the Liberty, and that was a game that was showcasing the two best teams right now in the regular season. If we segue over to the West Coast here, a team that we might think is going to be the best team come playoff time, that's going to be the Aces. Now sit at 14-7 and seven after their victory over the Storm, 84-79. to 79. We saw Asia Wilson, coach, 24-20 and 20 yesterday. The oh. best player in the WNBA, the Aces rounding into form. What are we thinking about the Aces' performance yesterday? I mean, she... She had a 24 and 20 game and she shot under 50% from the floor. Like that, that's the wildest thing. Guys, this could have been 30 and 20 that she could have had last mm. night. But here's what I love not just the 20 rebounds, right? But the fact that she had the four blocks, the three steals, the two assists, and guys, zero turnovers in 35 minutes. That is just a team. When she plays like this, it is phenomenal. But we keep going back to it. And, and Ben always calls her the right name, the point God. Ever, I know they lost the game last week, but ever since Chelsea Gray has come back, they have just rounded into form. They're in their right spots. And as much as Asia Wilson is playing well, played phenomenal, and is the best player in the world, hands down, it really, to me, has unlocked Jackie Young, where she could go worry about yeah. scoring more, and then they could put Kelsey Plum at the three-point line, Jack Young, high score yesterday besides Jewel Lloyd, 27 points, 10 of 19 for four, and miss, five of her misses were from three. She didn't even shoot the ball great either. But you said it best. They may not be the best team by record, but they are the defending champions. They are the best team in the WNBA, and they're still properly priced as a favorite to win a WNBA championship. Chelsea Gray did not play in the first 12 games of this season for Las Vegas after they won two consecutive WNBA titles they had lost three straight a three game skid for the first time since the 2019 season which just makes you laugh when you think about it they had dropped four of five before chelsea gray returned on the bench she's now back in the starting five for becky hammond and you can see the dividends jackie young the leading scorer 27 points yesterday despite a 20 and 20 game 24 points and 20 boards for asia wilson jy you saw the uh, the odds there as it pertains to the standings the aces have won eight of the nine games with gray back in the lineup 14 and 7 but still the fourth best record in the WNBA when you look at the top five I'm not going to ask you about the tier of two plus 145 the aces the favorites or the liberty the second best number plus 170 to have a WNBA finals rematch from a season ago this is my question can all five of those teams legitimately be in contention for a WNBA title or is it still just the two in front of everybody else no, I, I, I think you got to look at at least the team, the group of four, right? So I'm going to throw Minnesota in there, who has won the Commissioner's Cup, who has two wins over New York Liberty already, one on the road, one at home. Connecticut defends like no one's business. Ben, you know and I know it. Their problem is they don't shoot the ball well enough from three, 
but they will get you in a dogfight. They will muck it up and they will play the game their way. Seattle is intriguing because of the ability to score of Drew Lord, Megabur, Awumake, Scott Dickens Smith. They are players as well. The team that I still think is lying in the weeds that could give a team a scare in the playoffs, it's Phoenix because of Brittany Griner's size inside, the shot making creativity of Kalia Copper. Uh, and obviously the all-around game of Dan Trazi, uh, Natasha Cloud also as well. That team is dangerous as well, but it is amazing because I think there's more parity yeah. to the league this year. There's more teams that are going to be involved in the race, and I think it's going to make it exciting, especially if the semifinals are the Liberty and the Aces. I think the WBA needs the Aces to jump one of those spots. Listen, last year, by the time we got into the second half of the season, where we are now, we're well past 20 games for all teams around the WNBA in the 40-game regular season. Of course, all-star break on the horizon, the Olympic break on the horizon. But by the time we got to the second half last year, it was the Aces, it was the Liberty, and everybody else had a 12-1 to number or higher. You saw those five teams there all at plus 950 or shorter should be more balanced. Six teams with a winning record, including Phoenix, now 12 and 10. And Kalia Copper, huge game yesterday. The Mercury putting up the century mark in a win against Dallas. Now to the teams in seventh and eighth. For the two rookies, the debate up next. Canada is one of those teams that's the darling of, of the tournament right now. They're still 9-1. to one. To win a tournament, or even to advance far into a tournament like this, you need a bit of good fortune. And it doesn't matter if you're getting the good fortune that Canada has, where they played two matches where they were up a man, or you had the good fortune of Argentina, who's one of the best teams in the world, who just got on the good side of the draw. Newswire, only on SportsGrid. I want to know, too, what was the highest you ever got on both of those metrics? <clears throat> so the highest club speed I've ever gotten for 45-inch driver, we'll just say stock, was, I think it was 129.9. I never cracked 130. <laughs> never cracked 130. That was that was juice. That was on Kathy, and I can't even talk. And then I got one, 195 ball speed. 195 so was, ball speed. Only on Sports Grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. The early the line. Magical and historic season in Lincoln, Nebraska continues. He is the best player in the NBA, but also in the biggest moments where the national media is watching. Newswire. Something that we have never seen happen before with one of the iconic coaches in the game. Pharrell, coast to coast. The team covers. It's automatic. It's every time. Not, not sometimes. It's every time. Game time decisions. Luka is actually far more dangerous from three on the road this year than at home. This game here tonight, you may want to consider taking as many points as humanly possible. In game live, prime time. We got not one, but two coaches fired systems in place. Sports Rage this Late sort Night. Of has let down, written all over it. It's going to be hard to match the emotion that they played with the other night. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. The two rookies in the heat of the WNBA Rookie of the Year debate and the odds race on display yesterday on Camp Day in the WNBA. Indiana's Caitlin Clark, Chicago's Angel Reese, both adding historic performances yet again on a Wednesday afternoon. We start with the game in Indianapolis. We'll get to Caitlin Clark's stat line in just a moment. But for a fever team, JY, that entered winners of six of their last nine and play much better basketball as a seven-point home favorite, against one of the worst teams in the W, the Washington Mystics, to lose on your home floor by 5, 89, 84, despite a rally mm. attempt in the fourth and final quarter. 
not necessarily a good sight. How bad of a loss was this for the Fever yesterday? It, it was a bad loss, and let's be honest, Ben, they did not look like a team that was ready to play, a team that was down uh, by 14 points uh, at the break, uh, down almost 20 after three, and it took a feverish rally in the fourth quarter just to make it a game, and a team that has struggled on a defensive end of the floor. Uh, giving up 89 points in the game last night. That's not something you want to do, giving up 51 points in the first half. That's not the effort that the, uh, Christy Sides and that team needs to have if they're wanting to be taken seriously as a team that could make a playoff run. Now, I will say this. They're one of the worst teams in the WNBA, the Mystics. But do know, folks, after going 0-12 to start the year, True. this team is 6-5 and in their last 11 games. They have given teams some tough games. I know a New York Liberty game. I think that they they were I think they were close in. They only lost at uh, Minnesota by seven. Uh, so they, they took uh, the uh, the Sun to overtime. So a uh, coach Thibault's team is playing much better basketball. But still, Ben, after the way that that Fever team won against the Liberty over the weekend, that is not a good look at home. Seven point favorite to turn around and lose a game to the Mystics. Mm -hmm. Should have won that game. The Fever now sitting on the season with nine wins. You know, another team with nine wins right now after picking up a W yesterday. That's the sky. They win 78-69 to over the Dream, which included Angel Reese getting 11 points, 13 rebounds, and three steals to keep that double-double streak alive. But, Coach, not without some controversy here. Yeah. Well, I'm calling <laughs> conspiracy theory. I'm going into the Donnie right side playbook Do it. and it's simply put folks back in the day there was a football game Aaron Rodgers going back to pass Michael Strahan needed a sack to break the all-time record of Brett Favre see I hey I got the team right it was Brett Favre right. and what he should have rolled out left he rolled out right and here he is sack and he gets the record so now we look at Angel Reese and folks very simply put I don't care what anybody says if you're up seven with under seven seconds to play, why are you calling for the ball? Like, the game is over. What do you need the ball for? Oh, I know. You got nine points. But what do you need? You need someone from the other team to step up to the plate and help you. Her name? Tina Charles. Come on down to the congregation because you're in this too. You foul her, and then you go to the line, and everybody's happy. And everybody's saying, oh, what about Kayla Clark? And the coach left her in. No, 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 no. These are not the same. Seven-point lead, six seconds left. Game is over. If you get in a ball, don't touch her. It's stat padding, and I don't care what anybody says about it. It's really not a conspiracy theory. It was as clear as day to see Here's what was happening. Kennedy Carter had the ball in her possession under 10 seconds left, was going to dribble out the clock when Marina Mabry came down the floor for Chicago, called for it, throws it into Angel Reese. She is fouled with six seconds. Tina Charles kind of ducked out of there, the veteran that likes to help out the young rooks in the WNBA. One of her teammates on Atlanta put her arms up at the refs like, what are you blowing the whistle for in a game where we're down by seven with six seconds left? <laughs> to Angel Reese's credit, she had to hit both free throws, and she did. I don't think it diminishes her 13-game record double-double streak now at 14, but it does allow you to poke some holes in how this record came to be. Caitlin Clark yesterday, 29 points, 13 boards, or 13 assists, rather, five made threes, five boards, five steals, three blocks, the only stat line we have ever seen in the history of the WNBA or the NBA to put up those kind of numbers. Now a stronger favorite, J.Y., at minus 850 to win Rookie of the Year. Do you agree with the odds movement here in the final 30 seconds of this segment? To quote the famous WWF ref, uh, manager Slick, turn out the lights, the party's mm. over. It's done. Caitlin Clark, Rookie of the Year. Wow. That's where we stand right now. Many might debate that statement, but JY, we appreciate it. A fade away, a fade away to the break for JY. More in the early line up next. No stop heading here.
Canada. You know, Canada is one of those teams that's the darling of, of the tournament right now. They're still nine to one. To win a tournament or even to advance far into a tournament like this, you need a bit of good fortune. And it doesn't matter if you're getting the good fortune that Canada has where they play two matches where they were up a man, or you had the good fortune of Argentina, who's one of the best teams in the world, who just got on the good side of the draw. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. I want to know, too, what was the highest you ever got on both of those metrics? <clears throat> so the highest club I speed I've ever gotten for 45-inch driver, we'll just say stock, was... I think it was 129.9. I never cracked 130. <laughs> never cracked 130. That was that was juice. That was on Kathy and I can't even talk. And then I got one 195 ball speed. 195 so was, ball speed. Only on Sports Grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. The early the magical line. and historic season in Lincoln, Nebraska continues. He is the best player in the NBA, but also in the biggest moments where the national media is watching. Newswire. Something that we have never seen happen before with one of the iconic coaches in the game. Pharrell, coast to coast. The team covers. It's automatic. It's every time. Not, not sometimes. It's every time. Game time decisions. Lucas is actually far more dangerous from three on the road this year than at home. This game here tonight you may want to consider taking as many points as humanly possible. In game live, prime time. We got not one but two coaches fired systems in place. Sports rage this late sort night. Of has let down written all over it. It's going to be hard to match the emotion that they played with the other night. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. What a day it was out in Sin City in Las Vegas. We had the USA Showcase, the nightcap in men's basketball against Team Canada in day number two of Big 12 Media Days. Day number one of Mountain West Media Days. And after hours with the Pac-12, the Beavs and the Cougs of Oregon State and Washington State. So much to get to here in this collegiate capsule where we look at Donnie Wrightside's favorite stop on the sports calendar. That's media days around the nation in college football. Of course, one of the highlights yesterday on day number two of Big 12 Media Days at Allegiant Stadium, the home of the Las Vegas Raiders in Sin City, Deion Sanders. Year number two of the prime era in Boulder just about to begin. And Deion Sanders, DRS, at the podium yesterday was asked about his expectations for the season and how he is judged and the success level that Colorado is judged by in college football as well. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm judged on a different scale. I, I, my, my, my wins are totally different than your wins. Your wins... You just judging football. That's why I have to start out and give you education and academics and so forth. I have to give you those things so you understand there's a greater scope. I can't win nine games and we our GPA suffers. Our GPA can't be high, but we lose another eight games. We we can't not go and grab high school players and you got a bunch of guys in the portal uh, out of the portal that's getting incarcerated. My wins are different. We have to win in every area. That's the way we're judged. And I'm cool with that because we, we, we come a little different. Tony, I don't actually disagree with what Deion Sanders is saying. With all the attention and notoriety that is paid to this Buffs football program, each and every individual win is not just a win for a college football team to start off the season. It adds on a layer of significance because it generates national conversation. What are your reactions to what Deion Sanders had to say yesterday at Big 12 Media Day? Yes, yeah, 
I mean, he is a media guy. He's always been in the media, one of, of the best course. football players we've ever seen on the field, and he sort of brings that attention to himself. Now, also coupled with the fact where when they got to Colorado, talking about Dion's team, and that includes a lot of videographers, they made it a point. We're going to put this like a reality show. So, of course, they're going to judge you different than other teams at this point because we see more about Colorado, and you make it a point to go on talk shows and to fly around the country and go on pregame shows to talk up your program. That's why he's making so much money. That's why Colorado is sold out every single game, even if the results aren't measuring up. But no, nobody cares about GPA across any other football team anymore at this point here. So I think what he's basically saying is, I got a good football team and my team stunk before I got there. I got a couple wins. A lot of people would be praised for how many wins they got at Colorado, but I'm not for doing sure. that. But also, when you be – and sometimes we, we don't do any service here. If you would have said, okay, we honestly know what TCU will be by the end of the season, maybe it wasn't such a big win opening weekend, which put Colorado on that pedestal to begin with when maybe they didn't really beat a great football team at that time. But it's college football. You can't complain about being in the spotlight when you want to be in the spotlight. And I think that's the key, right? Deion Sanders, the guy that was the most exaggerated individual from the very start of his NFL career. Yeah. Dress good, feel good, play good. That's who mm -hmm. he has always been. He understands how to use the media attention. And he makes, he himself, prime, makes no bones about it. As you heard there, he's not running from the attention. He understands it. He is cool with it. I commend Deion Sanders for what he has done. I think it's the overall organization, though, right? Because you can talk the talk, but then you got to walk the walk. Shador Sanders, his son and his quarterback meeting with some media members yesterday, was asked about the level of notoriety in rising to the occasion. And Shador said, we're everybody's Super Bowl. Well, you can't be everybody's Super Bowl and lose eight Super Bowls then. You can't talk all the smack that you do and not deliver. But that's the fascinating thing to me, DRS, about CU. In the final year of Carl Durrell, before Deion Sanders became the head coach in Boulder, Colorado was the worst FBS football program, certainly at the Power 5 level. They won a single game. They were 1-11, so a 4-8 record the following year after a ton of roster turnover should only be seen as improvement and success. But with how Colorado did it, it does leave a little bit to be desired. They won their first three games of the year. They were the entirety of the conversation in September last year in college football. They got beat big by Oregon in week number four. They lost to USC in a high-scoring affair the following week. They won their first game of October against ASU and never won again. A 4-2 and two start quickly became a disappointing 4-8 and eight season. So now we talk about the Buffs in 2024. Five and a half is the win total. The over has the hefty juice at minus 158. If the odds makers are correct, DRS, that's bull eligibility for a second year head coach that had a huge elevation to the FBS and power conference level now in the Big 12 in a team that just two seasons ago won only a single game that should be deemed success. But in your estimation, is six wins in a bowl appearance enough to satisfy that thirst in Boulder? It should be this year because, and again, I don't get into the roster construction of what they have going forward next year. But the one thing I do know is they have a quarterback that's projected to be in the first round and in the upper part of that first sure. round. And if you have a five and a half win total, you should automatically get that with one of the best players in the country here. But having said that, there's a lot of turmoil on this team. And it doesn't necessarily come from Dion himself. There's a lot of roster turnover from guys getting out of the portal, in the portal. And also, there's a lot of coaching turnover from last year, what we saw into this year. Big that time. usually turns out the same. And all and when you're trying to take a look at the games that you play, as Dion joked about, and he's actually right about this. Hey, AD, you're supposed to give me a layup in game number one at home. NDSU is not a layup <laughs> at home as they're going to start that season. Now, granted, I do pick on the Big 12 because I don't think it's a great football conference overall. But when you look at that schedule, like there's decent opponent after decent opponent after decent opponent. So my first instinct would say, of course, they should get six wins. Then I look at that schedule and say, well, I actually don't know where the six wins come from here at this point. So for me, again, you have a quarterback that's supposed to be an upper-level NFL talent here. You should win six games. But then I look at the schedule and say, 
I don't know if six wins are on there, but then again, I'm not saying, hey, look, I really went through with a fine-tooth comb this schedule and also the team players that they have that are going to be playing next year. Yes, they should land at seven. This is going to be a tough season for him, and if they do make a bowl, that's going to be well-deserved. Absolutely so, but with the attention that Colorado brings, I wonder how we judge success, thus going to Dion's point that a win is not just simply a win. I couldn't agree more. Shador Sanders, 40-1 to to win the Heisman Trophy, thought by many to be a top five, top ten pick next year in the NFL draft. Travis Hunter, the best two-way player in college football, maybe the only two-way player in college football, (laughs) 65-1 to to win the Heisman Trophy, probably a top ten pick in the 2025 NFL draft as well. Baylor's Dave Aranda yesterday at Big 12 Media Days as well. Baylor's Mm. been on a recent successful run in recruiting. And when Aranda was asked why, he said it was pretty simple. We're paying players. I love Dave Miranda's candor. What say you, Donnie? I, it's fantastic, and Ben, you know me. I always say, just be real with us here. Don't say we yep. outworked everybody. He made a point like, yes, I'm a good football coach. I'm a good recruiter, but what's the difference? I can walk into somebody's home and say, I'll give you $350,000 to come be my right guard. That is going to help. If you remember back in the day, right, Old Miss and Q Freeze, how the heck did Old Miss suddenly become the best recruiting power? Q Freeze lied and goes, we just outworked every SEC team. No, you paid everybody more money than everybody else in the SEC. I love when coach Coaches give candor and honesty. Thank you, Dave Aranda. Love to see it. It certainly was the case. Then late night in Sin City, the remaining Pac-2, I mean, come Washington on, State and Oregon State, throwing after hours with the Beavs and Cougs that featured an open bar. Because as new commissioner Teresa Gold had to say, if anybody deserves a drink, it's the Pac-12. Donnie loves it, which he could have been there. MLB News next. Canada is one of those teams that's the darling of, of the tournament right now. They're still 9-1. to one. To win a tournament or even to advance far into a tournament like this, you need a bit of good fortune. And it doesn't matter if you're getting the good fortune that Canada has where they played two matches where they were up a man or you had the good fortune of Argentina, who's one of the best teams in the world, who just got on the good side of the draw. Newswire, only on SportsGrid. I want to know, too, what was the highest you ever got on both of those metrics? <clears throat> so the highest club SP I've ever gotten for 45-inch driver, we'll just say stock, was, I think it was 129.9. I never cracked 130. <laughs> never cracked 130. That was, that was juice. That was on caffeine. I can't even talk. And then I got one, 195 ball speed. 195 so was, ball speed. Only on Sports Grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. The early the line. Magical and historic season in Lincoln, Nebraska continues. He is the best player in the NBA, but also in the biggest moments where the national media is watching. Newswire. Something that we have never seen happen before with one of the iconic coaches in the game. Pharrell, coast to coast. The team covers. It's automatic. It's every time. Not, not sometimes. It's every time. Game time decisions. Lucas is actually far more dangerous from three on the road this year than at home. This game here tonight, you may want to consider taking as many points as humanly possible. In Game Live, prime time. We got not one, but two coaches fired systems in place. Sports Rage this Late sort Night. This sort of has written all over it. It's going to be hard to match the emotion that they played with the other night. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Jack, Jack McMullen is here on this Thursday morning on the early line on Sports Grid to go all around Major League Baseball. Doing great work, of course, with Just Baseball Media, the play-by-play voice of the Indianapolis Indians, the AAA affiliate of the Pittsburgh Pirates, is here 
live on this Thursday on TEL. Jack, as always, we appreciate the time. Thank you for being here on the Sports Grid Network. You bet, man. I love coming on with you guys. This is uh, we, we're in the good part of Major League Baseball, right? Where y- you start to get yep. the wild card teams separating each other. I know that two weeks ago, all the conversation in the National League was about parity. And everybody gets four days off, except for the ones that are really, really good. So that's probably a good thing for all these teams that are in the hunt. The All-Star break comes at the conclusion of a full day slate on Sunday. And who might that National League starter be for the All-Star game? Could it be a guy that Jack McMullen has called the game for? Paul Skeen's day number 11 in the history of Major League Baseball. We'll look at that in just a little bit. But, Jack, we look back first on yesterday's action around a robust Wednesday slate in MLB. The marquee matchup in these midweek sets, that's out in Philadelphia between the top two teams in the National League, the Philadelphia Phillies and the L.A. Dodgers. The Phils edge out L.A. for a second consecutive day, 4-3 victory in Game 2. Philly has won both of the opening two games of this set. Jack, how much stock do you put into the fact that Philadelphia has taken the first two from L.A.? A lot, frankly, and and I think they won it in the Philly way yesterday where they had the speed demons show themselves on the base pads, like, you know, Trey Turner legs out, you know, tough crown ball to Miguel Rojas, and that brings in Whit Merrifield. And, like, Schwarber went yard. It was a leadoff home run from Schwarber, and then they played enough small ball to win that game. I think the most underrated pitcher in baseball is Christopher Sanchez with the Philadelphia Phillies. And Sanchez absolutely proved that yesterday. I thought Christopher Sanchez deserved to be an all-star. He just got extended. Now, you think extended means you got a ton of money. Listen, he got good money, but relatively speaking, they got a deal on Sanchez. He'll make about $5 million a year for the next five years. So he is flying under the radar, and that guy has been such a calming presence at the back of that rotation. And, yeah, it's a rotation that features Wheeler and Nola, and it's a rotation that has Ranger Suarez, who is going to Arlington to be a National League All-Star. But they are not where they are without Christopher Sanchez. The offense did enough and he gave them an excellent start yesterday. I I think this means the world for Philly, showing that they can do that against a lineup with Shohei Otani and Freddie Freeman. I know no Mookie Betts, but they're good, man. They're really good. Hitting weather yesterday in Philadelphia for sure, and Sanchez was great, as he's been all year, particularly in a great hitter's ballpark at Citizens Bank Park. Jack, if we take a look at the comparisons between the Phillies and the Dodgers, what's one thing we know? Superstars on both sides. A great one through nine lineup for the Dodgers. Same thing with the Philadelphia Phillies. Solid bullpens on both sides, but when we really see what wins in the playoffs, it's that front-line pitching, and it appears the Phillies have it right now, and the Dodgers don't. So my question to you is, we're coming up on that trade deadline by the end of the month. Are the Dodgers probably going to be on the prowl for at least a true number two starter here? I I think their IL rotation, their injured list rotation, is one of the better rotations in all of baseball. It is. I was saying that at the beginning of the year with Tampa, too, when you had McClanahan and Rasmussen and Springs and Boz all on the IL and Taj Bradley on the IL. And I was like, that IL rotation is a top five rotation in baseball. I think the Dodgers IL rotation is a top five rotation in baseball. Not to mention they just optioned Bobby Miller, who just like hasn't looked right. We know Bobby Miller is better than this, but they optioned him yesterday. Um, I, I do think that they will be on the market for a guy. I think Jack Flaherty makes too much sense for the LA Dodgers, considering you know he's he's what fourteen million dollars this year. So the team that acquires him will owe him about five and a half six million dollars, and he's up after this year. So I, I think that Flaherty is the perfect fit. I think they look for a rental, though, because you do have Emmett Sheehan coming back at some point next year. Dustin May should be ready to go for next year. And Yoshinobu Yamamoto. And, oh, by the way, Shohei Otani pitches, too. He'll be ready to go. Um, Donnie, I do want to add one more thing. You mentioned Mm -hmm. it's the pitching that really gets you over the top. You also have to have a murderer's row in the bullpen. And the Phillies Mm -hmm. have a murderer's row in the bullpen. And that was the thing that jumped out to me. They put their winning assortment out yesterday in Kirkering, Alvarado, Strom, and Hoffman. And they got it done behind Christopher Sanchez. The Phillies are built to win this whole thing, and the Dodgers are a couple moves away from being there. 
plus 165 the price on la the dodgers remain the favorites but after the phils have taken the opening two games of this set really it was the 10 to 1 thrashing on uh tuesday night the phillies have shortened that gap plus 220 second best price let's turn our attention now to the american league where the al pennant favorites remain the new york yankees a big win yesterday two to one in the trop to stop some of the bleeding the yanks entered yesterday losers of 16 of their last 21 in the last month jack when you look at where the yankees were and where they are now on june 11th 47 and 21 a hefty odds on favorite to win the american league east a two-game lead over the orioles the win yesterday in o's loss to the cubs the yankees now trailing by two games atop the division and in the last month since june 11th to where we are here on july 11th a 9 and 17 record for the pinstripes just how concerned are you about the yankees for the remainder of this season Depends where you set the goalposts. I think if if you told me that, hey, the Yankees are the best team in baseball, your thoughts. I would say, ah, I disagree. I, I'm very concerned about that sentiment. The Yankees are one of the favorites in the American League. I'm totally with you. They have Garrett Cole. I know Garrett Cole has struggled since coming back. He's the best pitcher on the planet. Like, give him some time to get his feet back under him. Marcus Stroman, he worked around some traffic yesterday, but I thought he threw, you know, somewhat well. Um But the lineup, man, like take a look at this lineup and just go one by one through OPS. Judge is judge. Soto is Soto. In yesterday's lineup, and I know that they won 2-1, the only guy with an OPS above league average outside of Judge and Soto was Ben Rice, who's played like 10 games in his major league career. League average OPS (laughs) in Major League Baseball is 704. Everybody else, six of the nine guys were under 700. That lineup can't win a World Series right now, man. Yeah, Trent Grisham, the guy that delivered yesterday with both RBIs, is batting 176 this year. More with Jack on the other side of the break. Canada is one of those teams that's the darling of, of the tournament right now. They're still 9-1. to one. To win a tournament or even to advance far into a tournament like this, you need a bit of good fortune. And it doesn't matter if you're getting the good fortune that Canada has where they played two matches where they were up a man or you had the good fortune of Argentina, who's one of the best teams in the world, who just got on the good side of the draw. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. I want to know, too, what was the highest you ever got on both of those metrics? <clears throat> so the highest club I speed I've ever gotten for 45-inch driver, we'll just say stock, was, I think it was 129.9. I never cracked 130. <laughs> never cracked 130. That was that was juice. That was on caffeine. I can't even talk. And then I got one, 195 ball speed. 195 so was, ball speed. Only on Sports Grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. The early the line. Magical and historic season in Lincoln, Nebraska continues. He is the best player in the NBA, but also in the biggest moments where the national media is watching. Newswire. Something that we have never seen happen before with one of the iconic coaches in the game. Pharrell, coast to coast. The team covers. It's automatic. It's every time. Not not sometimes. It's every time. Game time decisions. Luka is actually far more dangerous from three on the road this year than at home. This game here tonight, you may want to consider taking as many points as humanly possible. In Game Live, prime time. We got not one, but two coaches fired systems in place. Sports Rage this Late sort Night. sort of has letdown written all over it. It's going to be hard to match the emotion that they played with the other night. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid.
The tradition lives on here on this Thursday on the early line on Sports Grid. It is Skeens Day number 11 in the history of Major League Baseball. And who better to break down a Paul Skeens start than the guy that called multiple of them at the AAA level in Indianapolis? That is Jack McMullen. Jack, we appreciate you joining us here once again for a second straight segment on the early line on Sports Grid. Interesting set so far in the midweek between those and the Brewers in Milwaukee. Pittsburgh won the first game 12 to 2. Milwaukee responded in a big way yesterday. Day baseball in the state of Wisconsin for Skeens Day number 11 in Roman numerals. That's XI. In the Pirates, a road favorite. In Milwaukee, what can we expect out of Paul Skeens today against the Brewers? What are you expecting other than utter domination, which is what he's given you in his first 10 major league starts? I, there was a stretch of two straight starts where he allowed a leadoff homer, and that was it. Like He is pound for pound, I think, the best pitcher in Major League Baseball right now. He's the most talented pitcher in Major League Baseball, and the fact that he has pitch ability to go along with that is insane. I know record doesn't really matter, but he's 5-0 and in his first 10 starts. That tells you that his presence alone gets the offense fired up, and they give him enough. Now, he does have five no decisions, but he's not getting beaten, and chances are the Pirates are leveling up for him. This guy is absolutely amazing, and I, I think I've told you guys before, every day before his start, every, every pre-start meal – is chicken alfredo for him day games are a little weird because instead of a socially acceptable time to eat chicken alfredo for a 7 p.m <laughs> first trip, like, hey i'll mm. have my chicken alfredo at 2 30 he's having it at nine and he's not gonna adjust because why would you adjust when you're pound for pound the best pitcher on the planet right now He's been tremendous. And if you include him in Major League Baseball over the past 60 days with other pitchers, like the numbers I love, the XFIP minus number, a 59, which is sensational. We see the ERA at a 2.12, the XFIP number at a 2.34. He has been tremendous, which brings me to my next point here. You take a look at him for the NL Rookie of the Year as a minus 350 price, Cy Young at a 50-1 yeah. to 1 price. We know the Pittsburgh Pirates probably aren't going to factor into the postseason this year. Give me the thought process, Jack, heading down the stretch where you know he might be involved in the Cy Young Award. He obviously is going to be involved in the Rookie of the Year. Do the Pittsburgh Pirates let him go, or do you say, look, we're worried about your career here, the innings on your arm, let's get to the offseason. How does it play out in Pittsburgh in your mind this year? I think they did a lot of proactive planning, and you saw him heavily protected in AAA when he was throwing. Like, his season debut, he went three innings, and it was nine up, nine down. I think it was five punch outs, but, like, he wasn't going past the nine hitter in that. He was going to see a lineup first time through, and that was it. He was working on five days rest, unlike the typical, you know, four-day rest schedule at the major league level. He, he's gone on five days rest more often than on four days rest at the big league level to this point as well. I think they've done a really good job of proactively kind of delaying him out of the starting gate. Uh, their other guy, Jared Jones, I mean, like they're kind of suspension yeah. bridging him right now. And I know that he just hit the IL, but uh, I mean, this kind of works seamlessly with an innings limitation that they may have had. It's unfortunate that, you know, the IL needed to be involved there, um, but, you know, hoping that he feels healthy very soon, uh, but they probably would have scaled him back, you know, close to right now because, He's tracking to blow by his career high in innings. There are a bunch of guys like that. There are a bunch of young starters like that in Major League Baseball. I think you may see a couple of abbreviated turns from Skeens in August, but in September, like, don't expect Skeens to be sitting out of start. He's going to start games in September. Jack, I'm going to ask you two questions. First, very quick, I just want a one-word answer. And then secondly, on the 2024 MLB <laughs> draft. First question on Paul Skeens. Is he going to be the National League starter for the All-Star game on Tuesday in Arlington? Mm. You can't do this to mm. me. Uh, no. No. <laughs> Jack you Nicola doesn't even believe in this, guys. That's what we're going to clip. Oh, That's what we're no. going to clip yep. and go yep. off. Yep. With... Send it right to him. I, no I believe in my guys. I believe in my guys. I believe in seniority <laughs> okay. as well. Chris Sale's been really good. I believe in seniority. Okay. Fair enough. Secondly, Sunday night, 2024 MLB draft. Travis Bazana out of Oregon State. The Australian who batted 407 Amazing. this year for the Beavs is wow. the odds on favorite to go first overall. Do you agree? Uh, no. Away. 
I don't. Um, Aram Layton, who's my co-host at Just Baseball, put together a mock draft, and I, I think he made a, a perfect point that this could turn into a money game. They have $10.5 million to play with as the slot value for 1-1. One, one. J.J. Weatherholt may be under slot. J.J. Weatherholt, the shortstop second baseman out of West Virginia, is the name to watch. Jack McBoyne, as always, thank you. More T.E.L. next.